Good afternoon. I'm Christopher Leprad with External Affairs and Communications at the American Chemical Society, and I'd like to welcome you to this news briefing live from the 253rd National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society here in San Francisco, California. We're joined today by Dr. Clifford Murphy from Roger Williams University. Today he'll be talking about his work to develop a handheld device that could help authorities clamp down on the practice of cyanide fishing. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Murphy, and you know, please explain to us about this process. Thank you for having me. Um, so cyanide fishing is a procedure that people use to uh, acquire tropical ornamental fish primarily uh, for sale. Uh, tropical ornamental fish, uh, tropical marine ornamentals in particular, become really popular after some of the Pixar movies like Finding Nemo or Finding Dory. People want to have these brightly colored fish in their homes in saltwater aquaria. Uh, most of these fish are not reared via aquaculture, although there's a lot of research in that uh, area, and so most of these fish are live caught. A uh, particular method of catching these fish that is illegal and dangerous is cyanide fishing. Uh, the fishermen will mix some sodium cyanide or potassium cyanide in a plastic bottle with seawater. They'll bring it with them diving amongst the uh, coral reefs. They squirt this cyanide seawater in the vicinity of the fish and it'll knock them out. Uh, essentially stun them for a few minutes, making it very easy for them to scoop them up into bags and bring them up. Uh, the fish are then rinsed with seawater, and after a little while, most of them will recover, although some will die from this process. Um, this is very dangerous and illegal. Um, it's harmful to the fish, but more importantly, uh, from certain aspects, it's very harmful to the environment, particularly the coral reefs and the, um, the, the flora and fauna that are fastened to the reefs that can't swim away, cannot wait for the cyanide to dissipate, and end up being killed or bleached. Now, cyanide fishing um, is illegal and is processed uh, internationally. There is a lab in Manila in the Philippines um, specifically to process samples for cyanide fishing. When they do this, they acquire some of the, the fish, some live specimens. Some of those fish may need to be destroyed in the process of testing for that cyanide. Um, by looking through organs or, you know, sometimes you're looking in the seawater. Uh, there was a publication recently uh, by a group in Portugal who suggested they could detect the iocyanate in the seawater, which is a primary metabolite, metabolite of the cyanide, and use that as a marker that's non-destructive to fish. Um, their method suggests that thiocyanate will be um, uh, processed into the water, excreted into the water over the course of the next 28 days, and so this would be a great marker. Uh, my colleague, Andy Ryan, at Roger Williams University has been particularly interested in tropical fish trade and um, cyanide fishing in particular. And he was asking for different ways we could do this analysis. If we could do it faster, if we could make it cheaper, safer, or could we make it portable? And I said, sure. Um, our idea is we're using uh, metalloporphins that are mobilized on titanium uh, dioxide on a fluorine dope tin oxide uh, substrate. Uh, that substrate is um, optically transmissive, so we thought we could use optical detection. It is also um, electrically conductive, so we can use electrochemistry. Um, what we'll be presenting at the se poster session in Organic uh, tomorrow afternoon is the electrochemistry response that we've had. Um, the, the short answer for us is that we can, from fish samples that have been exposed, we can detect quantitatively whether fish have been exposed to cyanide or not. Um, by detecting the thiocyanate in seawater um, electrochemically. Um, quantita um, quantitative determination of this is mainly uh, limited for us by engineering. Uh, the way we make our electrodes, they're handmade individually using stuff that, um, techniques that are known in disensitized solar cells, uh, the doctor blading method for putting down TiO2, for annealing it in ovens. Um, we silenate, we put uh, porphyrins on there. Uh, but because we're making these almost individually, our batches are maybe four or six, but there's variation in the batches. Our ability to quantitate exactly how much uh, thiocyanate is present or how much cyanide may have been in the fish isn't there, but we have been able to, we've been very successful thus far in distinguishing between control samples and fish that had been exposed to cyanide, either at light or uh, heavier exposures. I don't know where to take it. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Murphy. I'd like to open up the, uh, the floor to questions. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. 
Um, I'm actually fascinated. I'd never heard of this problem of cyanide fishing before. Can you give a bit of background as to how many fish in tropical aquariums may have come, um, may have been there by the, as a result of this process? And is it a global problem? I mean, is it more prevalent in certain countries than others in terms of... I can answer portions of that. Um, so a lot of our marine ornamental fish uh, predominantly are coming into the U.S. are coming in from Indonesia and the, the, you know, the South Asian seas. Um, this is a particular problem in the reefs off the, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Um, that's where it's most prevalent. Um, I don't know that that's the only place where this technique is used. Um, this technique has been enough of a problem for them to establish a lab specific to cyanide detection in fish in the Manila. Um, so I can't speak to the extent, like how many of the fish that come into the U.S. have been, you know, were caught using the cyanide uh, method. Um, but partly the reason we can't do that, it's very hard to determine this forensically without either destroying fish or taking samples. It's very hard to enforce these laws without knowing that they're coming in. And so that's part of the problem we're trying to address. Can we make a, a technique or a handheld device um, that makes it portable and easier to start the detection? And then from there, can you start the enforcement or actually tracking how many fish have come in that were caught by cyanide fishing? Yes, sir. Are there any natural processes, sorry, Ben Valsley from Chemistry World, are, are there any natural processes in, in the fish that would cause them to produce thiocyanate it, that would give you a, a false positive? The thiocyanate is a primary metabolic process for fish that have been exposed to cyanide in some way. There are not, I'm not going to say there are none, but there are very few naturally occurring cyanide exposures in the oceans that I couldn't think of. Um, is it necessarily cyanide fishing is a different question. If you have runoff, say, from a place where you're doing paper mills or wood processing, you might have cyanide in that sewage outflow there. And then that would be expressed, you know, that might be some of the thiocyanate that we then later detect. But the levels that we're detecting and what we're, we're doing with the fish, um, it'd be very hard for it to come from somewhere else. So part of the process when they acquire these fish is um, when they bring them up to the boats, they're going to put them into a series of different uh, saltwater tanks that are presumably clean, have no cyanide or thiocyanate in them, so that they can rinse them and allow the fish to recover. Those fish are, you know, those waters routinely exchanged and then brought, brought to it. What we're sampling specifically is water in the tank with the fish. Um, it'd be very hard for it to come from somewhere else. Um, but not impossible. And how affordable do you think the test is likely to be, given the sorts of countries where it would be most useful tend to be developing countries? So right now, um, you know, with the students I'm working with, we're making the electrodes. The, the processes we're following are the same ones people have been using for disensitized solar cells. And the whole objective in Graz law in making the disensitized solar cells is making those as cheap as possible. Um, you know, the coated, coated glass is not expensive. The titanium dioxide is not expensive. The, the chemical processes we're using are not terribly expensive. Um, Making the devices and what happens in processing it, I don't know, um, but I don't anticipate it being very expensive. A concern that we have, one of the issues with reproducibility, where we're concerned from electrode to electrode, is that our electrodes, while they're very sensitive to thiocyanate, it is a one-time use. They would have to be a consumable, um, which doesn't imply some cost, but I don't think it's the same cost as, say, some of the laboratory techniques. It's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. How much um, cyanate are these uh, fishermen actually using? You said that the technique is, is quantitative. So how much are you detecting in a fish? And does that sort of then tell you how much they're using in the oceans? I don't know how much they're using in the ocean. Um, from some of the, the visuals of how the technique is done, they're spraying uh, cyanide laced seawater and I don't know exactly how much they're using how much they're adding um, for us and our, our detectors specifically so the literature methods for the thiocyanate um, from the group in Portugal 
Um, they have a modified HPLC method that they suggest they are sensitive to thiocyanate in seawater down to 3.2 parts per billion. Um, our electrodes, uh, as a laboratory technique using cyclic voltammetry, we suspect that we are sensitive down to sub part per billion, about uh, 0.5 parts per billion. Um, but our electrodes also have a tendency currently to saturate at 5 to 8 parts per billion thiocyanate. If there's more than that, I couldn't tell you, just that there's more. Um, with the fish and the, the fish samples, you know, what happens with us, the amount that we're detecting, the electrodes seem to sa be saturated. Um, so that's what I mean by qualitative. I know that there's probably about five parts per billion thiocyanate or more in the seawater. How that goes back to the how much cyanide the fish have been exposed to, I don't know. Um, the fish in the process of um, metabolizing cyanide as they're recovering, they will be releasing the thiocyanate for as long as a month or maybe longer um, in small amounts. And can you also give a case example of where this cyanate fishing has posed a particular environmental problem? Uh, is, is there a, a particular reef or um, stretch of ocean where it, it, it's actually been documented as, as causing a really dramatic effect? I don't know that answer specifically. Um, I'm working with a colleague, Dr. Andy Ryan. He's been tracking that kind of information. He might have been able to, to answer that. Um, I know that there are images for the reefs that are um, down in South, Southeast Asia that have been bleached, um, where the zoanthellae are no longer present, and one of the reasons for that is suspected cyanide fishing. Okay, thank you. Bill Buslik, American Chemical Society. Uh, I have a recollection that uh, that to rescue people uh, from cyanide poisoning, they uh, they used to administer, uh, administer sodium thiosulfate. Uh, uh, so, it's it's a, a kind of a inorganic reaction that uh, that you get. So, all your thiocyanate uh, is not necessarily coming from uh, from, uh, from uh, fishing uh, for tropical fish. Uh, particularly since, since mines frequently, gold mines particularly, release cyanide in, in, in <coughs> flowing water, in water, and that poisons a lot of thing, uh, things. But you can actually, if you do it early enough, rescue the, uh, whoever was poisoned. Uh, will you comment on that? Well, I'd like to look at the problem a little bit differently, sir. Um, the the use in the technique of cyanide fishing is known, has been specifically you know, made illegal, and people are specifically working to prosecute it. Um, the, where the fish are and how they're caught, I mean, if they are downstream from a sewage outflow where you might be having something coming from offshore, I agree with you. There might be some other source of cyanide, not simply cyanide fishing. Um, but some of the regions where they're going to are, are well well out into the ocean to get into the, the reefs to obtain those fish. If those fish are processing thiocyanate, you know, that's a metabolic pathway for them. About 80% of cyanide that comes in is going to be processed and released or excreted as thiocyanate. If the fish are, if the water around the fish in those tanks has thiocyanate in them, it's going to be a strong indicator for us. It's likely they were caught by cyanide fishing. How that turns into an enforcement or um, you know, legal process and, and making certain of that, I don't know. Um, what our device will do is it'll tell us the thiocyanate is there. Um, what seems most likely for those fish is that it's, you know, it's an indicator that it's likely that they were caught by cyanide fishing. That's a particular issue. But if we're detecting thiocyanate and these fish were caught near the shore, that's probably an indication, you know, cyanide fishing, or it could be something wrong with the sewage outflow. That is also important, and we should also look into that. I didn't mean to minimize uh, the importance of the, uh, because any cyanide anywhere, uh, anywhere is a problem. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so, but uh, seeing thiocyanide the cyanate is, is not necessarily an ind indicator of the, the fishing, particularly since uh, your uh, experiment was uh, somewhere near Rhode Island. Uh, there aren't too many uh, 
fish, uh, tropical fish up, up in the bay over there. So Roger Williams University, uh, one of the things, uh, Andy Ryan in particular, he's working in a dual appointment with New England Aquarium and Roger Williams University. Um, the marine biology department there, uh, what they've been working consistently on for years is on the aquaculture, the rearing and raising of tropical fish. And so we raise clownfish. Hi, Katie Cottingham Hello. from the American Chemical Society. So I had a question. Um, when will this device be available for authorities to use in the field? And how easy would it be to use? Uh, we're still working on building a, a fully functioning prototype. Um, but we have been working in parallel both uh, for its use as a laboratory technique and its use as a portable technique. Um, our portable technique is less sensitive to thiocyanate, uh, limited detection of about two to three parts per billion thiocyanate in seawater. And again, that is also has the same problems with our electrode construction, so it's qualitative for us, not quantitative. Um, but we're working on that process now. If we were um, in the next steps, if we were able to bring this into an industrial setting with someone and work at some of the engineering problems that we're, you know, we're encountering now with reproduction and um, consistency between electrodes, I would guess that it might be able to go to market in one or two years. Dr. Murphy, I actually have a question as well. Could you sort of highlight some of the global collaboration that you had to undertake? I mean, as was mentioned, Roger Williams is in Rhode Island, and we're looking at tropical fish, but you also mentioned partners in Portugal. Who all have you worked with to bring this to fruition? I'm not working specifically with a group in Portugal. Um, yeah, I don't want to get his name wrong. Um, I think it's Nas. And in Portugal has a paper, he is a colleague of Andy Ryan's. They are not working together directly, but they are part of a, a larger conversation that's going on about cyanide fishing. Um, I'm getting most of the, the tropical fish information from our marine biology department. I really treated this as a chemistry problem. Can we detect thiocyanate in seawater? Um, particularly with the kind of you know, interference we're likely to run into, halides and such. We're using metal porphyrins. They're known to bind the, the metal halides as well as the thiocyanate. Um, we are seeing a specific response for thiocyanate in the seawater. And so from a, from a chemistry perspective, I think we're in a good place. The um, marine biology, you know, how it's used and then where, it, where it's coming from, how long are the fish going to be you know, releasing it, are we... You know, can we you know, work with the, the group in Portugal, try and reproduce their results, that kind of thing. Um, it hasn't been something I've been directly involved with. Thank you very much. I'd uh, like to thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And the archived version of this session will be posted uh, soon on bit.ly backslash ACS Live underscore San Francisco. Please join us for our next press conference tomorrow at 9 a.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time about how hair strands can reveal lifestyle secrets of criminals. Thank you.